Hey, this is Carl J. De La Cruz and I'm on my second year of nursing already and for this video I'll be performing medical hand washing, open gloving, and Leopold's maneuver. So Leopold's maneuver is a common and systematic way to determine the position of the fetus. So it is non-invasive and easy to perform. There are four steps in this procedure. First is the fundal grip, second is the lateral grip, third is the pollex grip, and fourth is the deep pelvic grip. And before all that, I'll be performing hand washing and open gloving first, so let's go. So, hand washing is the most effective way to prevent the spread of microorganisms. But before we start with the actual procedure of hand washing, let us check for the completeness of supply first. So the first item is soap. So soap comes in the form of bore, but I have here a liquid antimicrobial soap. So this will be the main element for a hand washing procedure. So soaps are actually surfactants and it means that these will remove dirt and sweat off from our body. Next is to secure a source of running water. And lastly, paper towels to pack dry our hands after rinsing it with water. Next thing is to keep in mind that the sink is a contaminated area. So I have to distance myself from the sink to avoid touching it. Now I have here a watch which I should remove along with other jewelries or accessories in my hand because it promotes the growth of microorganisms. Now I'll also remove my ID so that it won't get away with my hand washing procedure. Now let's proceed to the actual hand washing procedure. So first let's turn on the faucet and make sure that the water pressure is just right to avoid splashing. Next is to wet our hands from the wrist with fingers pointing downwards and elbows should not be below our hands so that the water would flow from the cleanest area which is our forearm to the dirtiest area which is our fingers. Now first let's inspect for our cuticles, our hands and our forearms and if so that happens that I have an open wound I should report it immediately so that I will be transferred to a less infectious procedure or else I will just be exposing myself to hazards. Now let's grab our soap and then lather it thoroughly with our hands rubbing. Make sure to get an ample amount of soap so we would get the ideal amount of bubbles. So we'll just lather our heads with soap in a circular motion until it forms bubbles. Now that it formed bubbles in a circular manner, let's rub our palm to palm for about 15 to 20 seconds. Next is to interlace our fingers with the back of our hand and our palm rubbing for at least five times each side. Next is for the other's hand. Now let's rub our palm to palm with fingers interlaced. Rub the back of our fingers with the opposing palm with fingers interlocked. Now rub each thumb in a rotational movement. Now I'll do this with each of our fingers. Now clasp our fingers and rub it in a circular motion to the other palm. And do it for the other side as well. Now rub each wrist with the opposite palm. And then the other.
So these methods of hand washing use a circular motion to create friction that removes microorganisms mechanically. And interlacing your fingers will clean the interdigital spaces. And sometimes our fingertips and nails are commonly missed during hand hygiene. So clasping your fingers really do the job of cleaning them. Now let's rinse our hands thoroughly. Remember that the water should flow from the least contaminated area to the most contaminated area. This time, let's grab our paper towel and pat dry our hands from the fingers to wrist. We have to make sure that we should pat it, not rub, since it irritates our skin. And use this paper towel to turn into the faucet. Lastly, properly dispose our paper towel so that it would prevent cross-contamination. In healthcare settings, remember to follow the five moments of hand washing. Before touching a patient, before a procedure, after the procedure, after touching a patient, and after touching the patient's surroundings. And that's it for our hand washing. So now that we're done performing hand hygiene, let us now proceed with the actual gloving. So using gloves will reduce the risk of cross-contamination between the clients and the health workers. This will also serve as a protection from blood and other bodily fluids. But we must keep in mind that using sterile gloves will not replace hand washing. That is why we ensure proper hand hygiene before and after doing a procedure. So before just taking any pair of gloves, check first the correct size. So you can check your glove size by taking a tape measure and wrapping it around your palm horizontally. So my glove size is 8. So I have here a glove with size 8. So using a pair of gloves that actually fits our hand, will ensure that the objects would be easier to pick up. So next thing is to review the patient's medical records. This is for us to determine which type of glove to use. So some patients are actually allergic to some types of gloves. For example, latex gloves. So you have to find another material of gloves for them. But in this case, I have here a sterile latex glove. So what we need to do first is to remove the outer packaging of the glove by carefully peeling apart sides. Now, this, this here is the inner package, and we can discard the outer package or just set it, set it aside for a while. So the gloves should be laid on a clean, dry, and flat surface above waist level area, since any moisture could contaminate the gloves. So as you can see here, my table is below the waist level area, so I can take this box right here and elevate the surface. So in healthcare settings, anything below the waist level area are actually considered as contaminated. That is why we need an elevated surface. So usually the inner package indicates which glove is for which hand. So we can see here that this is for the right hand glove and this is for the left hand glove. This fold right here is what you call the flaps. This will assist us in opening the glove and to keep the inside surface of the glove sterile. Touch only the flaps and carefully open the, the inner package. So earlier, we identified which is the right hand glove and the left hand glove. I am right handed, so I'll glove my dominant hand first so that it will be easier to glove my non-dominant hand right after. Since tears and stains could indicate that the glove is likely to be unsterile and therefore cannot be used in a procedure anymore. In donning the glove, we must make sure that we only touch the inner surface of the glove and avoiding the outer surface since it is the sterile part of the glove. So with the thumb and the first two fingers of my non-dominant hand, grasp the edge of the dominant glove and carefully pull it over my dominant hand. Be careful not to roll up the sleeves. That's it. So now that this is sterile, I should not touch it. So with our glove dominant hand, slip the fingers underneath the next glove and carefully pull it over our non-dominant hand. Now, adjust the creases without touching your skin. And interlock your fingers 
pulling it away from your body and above waist level area. So we actually do this to avoid touching any unsterile objects and that includes our gown or our uniform which could contaminate the gloves. So now that we're done with the glove donning, we are now ready to do the procedure. So after the procedure, we have to dispose our gloves properly. This time, I'll show you how to doff the glove properly. So the first thing to do is to grasp the outside of other glove hand without touching the wrist, pull halfway through the palm, and place it under the cuff of other glove. Next is to take your bare thumb and slip it underneath the other glove hand and gently pull it over and discard the receptacle. So we are done with the glove doffing, but we are not done yet. We have to perform another hand hygiene procedure just to make sure that there will be no residues that could promote cross-contamination. So I already washed my hands earlier to prevent the spread of microorganisms. Now I'll start by explaining the procedures to the clients for their awareness and to reduce their anxiety during the procedure so they would cooperate. Right, so hi, my name is Carl. I'll be your senior nurse. So may I know your full name, please? So when is your birthday? How old are you? Alright, so how do you want to call you? Alright, so Dr. I'll be with you for your abdominal examination. We'll be doing the opposed maneuver. So we do this preferably after 24 weeks of gestation or until when the fetal outline can be popped in the knee. Then after that, we'll be doing oscillation to listen for the fetal heart rate. Alright, so before all of that, um, do you have any questions or clarifications? Alright, so it would be better if we could urinate first before we started. Alright, so now I'll have to, I have the client to empty her bladder for her comfort and to reduce bladder distension. Alright, so now that you've emptied your bladder, um, I'm going to assist you to a supine position. And slightly bend your knees. This will reduce the stretchings and tensions on your abdominal muscles for it to be easier to be palpated. Next, I'll be I'll have myself stand at the right side because I'm right-handed for my dominant hand to reach easily the inferior side of her body, specifically on her abdomen. Alright, so now I'll proceed to the first maneuver, which is the fundal grip. This is to determine with which fetal part is lying on the fundus. So to start this, I'll have to face the mother and start by palpating on top of the fundus. So the head should feel firm and moves independently, whereas the buttocks should feel squishy. So for the second maneuver or the lateral grip, I'll be palpating on either side of the abdomen to locate the back of the fetus. So one of my hands should be on the side while the other is palpating. Then I'll be doing the same thing on the opposite side as well. So the back of the fetus should feel flat and long. And this is important to know because that is where we will be placing our stethoscope to oscillate for fetal heart rate. Since that is where we can get the most accurate fetal heart rate tracing. So for the, so for the third maneuver, it is the pollux grip. It is used to determine whether the head is engaged in the pelvis. So if the head is down, I'm going to make an L with my fingers and place it near the synthesis pubis. So let's check if the baby's head is engaged or not. If I cannot lift the baby's head, it means that it is engaged. If I can lift the baby's head, it means that it is not engaged. So for the fourth maneuver or the last, it is the deep pelvic grip or it is used to determine whether the head of the baby is flexed. So this one, I'm going to face the inferior side of her body facing towards her foot and then start by pressing downwards. So the brow should be at the opposite side of the back and we don't have to do the fourth maneuver if the baby is in each presentation. Alright, so now we're done with the Leopold's maneuver or the population for the fetus assessment. I'll be oscillating for the fetal heart rate. So first, I'm going to need my stethoscope and check whether the stethoscope is warm to touch. Alright. So I already located the, during the second maneuver, I already located the back of the fetus and will be placing the stethoscope over that area. Alright. So now, I'm going to listen for one full minute and note the fetal heart rate. 
So this time I'm going to note for the fetal heart rate and the location of the back of the fetus which is in the left side of the mother and then inform the mother of the result. Right, so the fetal heart rate is 130 beats per minute which is under normal conditions. Alright, so you've been wonderful. I'll just sum up the findings that we did earlier. Um, so for to start that, uh, the baby is in cephalic position, which means that the baby is head down. Then in LOP or left occiput posterior position, that position is actually quite prone to back pain. So what you're going to do is to place a pillow between your legs and below your abdomen while you sleep on your side for proper body mechanics. Next is the fetal attitude is in full and complete flexion which means it is a good attitude. And during the third maneuver, I can freely move the baby's head, which means that it is not engaged and still floating. All right, so that's it for our assessment. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna document the findings and you're good to go. All right, so thank you for your cooperation. So after the assessment, I'm gonna make sure that I wash my hands for my own personal hygiene.